Welcome, everyone. And we've got a really special guest today. It's Patrick Byrne, the founder and CEO of Overstock.com. Patrick, how are you doing? Mike, great to be talking to you again. I've missed, uh, I've missed, uh, I've thought often over the time we met face to face, and I've really enjoyed your your uh, show, The Hidden Secrets of Money, on on YouTube. Yeah, thanks. You know, it was about three years ago, I think, that we came to Salt Lake City to interview you for episode eight of Hidden Secrets of Money. And uh, what was, you know, it was interesting how much we had in common. We both own Tesla Roadsters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you still have yours? I do indeed. Excellent. Well, I just I love it. How about, you? how about you? Oh, it's my favorite car in the world. I am head over heels in love with it. And right now it's in Florida getting some modifications done to it. I'll show you all of that when they're done. I'll, I'll send you some video on it. But I want to tell some of the audience here about uh, your career and some of the amazing things that you've been able to accomplish. Back in 2004, you began a campaign exposing Wall Street's regulatory capture, hedge fund mischief, settlement system failures, systemic risk, and its vulnerability to economic warfare. And you were vindicated. You know, you made some allegations against Wall Street. And people uh, always think that somebody's like a tinfoil hatter when they go against the grain of the establishment. And, you know, you went out on a limb and pointed these things out. And then you were vindicated in 2008 uh, when the global economic crisis showed that many of the things that you were warning about were absolutely true. They, they actually happened. And then uh, because of that, you subsequently won a bunch of awards. You won the Web Blogs Award for Best Business Blog, the Business Pundits Award for Best Business Investigative Journalism, and Xmark's top uh, site on corruption in the USA. And then over the years, Forbes has named Overstock.com the ninth best company to work for in the country and one of the most trustworthy companies in America. And it, Forbes also named you uh, the CEO with the highest employee approval rating uh, of all companies in the United States. That's pretty amazing. Uh, well, it's better to be lucky than smart. But thank you very much, Mike. One of the amazing things that I found out about you when we interviewed you last time is that you're basically a protege of bo both Warren Buffett and Milton Friedman, who is one of my personal heroes. I just love Milton Friedman. And... But the most important thing about than any of this is that you describe yourself as a classical liberal. I am also a classical liberal, and it basically means that you're fighting for freedom and liberty. Liberty. These are the things that you believe in above all, and that's the reason that we came to Salt Lake City to interview you that time. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, Tell, can you tell the audience more about your background with uh, Warren Buffett and Milton Friedman? Because I just found this fascinating. Well, sure, I'd be honored to. I, I, it's giving me too much credit to say a protege, but I would say they're my great te they're my great teachers in life. When I was a teenager, I met Mr. Buffett, and it was before he was the famous Warren Buffett. He was just sort of this eccentric fellow from Nebraska that I thought was a farmer, but who knew something about stock. We had the most interesting relationship as when I was a teenager and I'd write him letters and go see him. And he, he always made time for me. It was, he was really exceptionally generous. And I was in college when I started, when his name started getting in the paper as this. Uh, so, but he, he's been sort of my great Dutch uncle in life and has taught me not only a lot about business, but a lot about, about life. And then with Milton Friedman, I observed him at Stanford. I did my PhD at Stanford, but I did not, uh, I observed him as one did, does it's a giant like that on the campus and then uh in about six years before his death i got very involved with the school choice movement which i think is the long-term way to save the republic and milton milton friedman really invented the school choice movement which means vouchers or educational savings accounts or charters etc that providing people choice so i got to know him for, uh, in the last six years of his life and it was a great honor yeah, uh, that's amazing. Now, you had a, there was this extended conversation where you were the intermediary between Milton Friedman and Warren Buffett for quite a while, an economic discussion that they were having. And uh, 
you had to basically carry the message between them. Uh, tell us about that a little bit. You remember that? Yeah, well, it was funny just because I knew both of them. And I saw, especially in that period, I saw uh, Mr. Buffett quite, you know, more frequently, a few times a year. I was in the position of taking an argument, carrying it on back and forth between them, discussion, and we were, t- and it was about trade and among my, many things. But I saw, it's actually, I saw, Maybe the one time, I mean, Milton was a fabulous debater, but I have to say I may have seen his argument bested because Buffett was arguing for a modified free trade regime. And Milton, of course, was arguing for a, uh, a, much, a much more open one. And he, Buffett was making this point about, well, eventually there's, we're going to hollow out our currency and then our grandchildren are left with this devalued currency. And Milton was saying, well, won't the currency adjust itself over time? And so that, that problem takes care of itself. And, Mil- and Buffett's answer was really funny. He said, Patrick, don't ever forget that economists love to see the world in terms of lines that intersect and smoothly readjust. What they don't get is that those lines sometimes get hung up. They, they get hung up, whether from history or human psychology or whatever they get caught and then these art these great architectonic forces go to work and push and push and push and then someday somewhere patrick and archduke get shot and then that happens and the lines snap and then there's all this human misery and i thought that was that's a very buffett way to explain something someday somewhere an archduke gets shot you know and then the whole yeah you're uh, referring to world war one yeah that's how but that's how buffett speaks he speaks in metaphors like that so i think i i saw his point i actually i know it would be heresy to Milton, but I like uh, Buffett had a very has a very interesting idea on how to solve our trade deficit that he put forth about twenty years ago. That uh, I guess anyway, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. I want to take um, yeah. Uh, what do you think about the current state of the global econ- the U.S. economy, and the global economy, and where it's headed? Well. The deep structure is for something over 100 years, we have been dependent on a, a form of money that is debt-based and fractionally reserved and Keynesian multiplied. And I think we're living in a magic money tree. And someday it all comes a tumbling down. Uh, the, the structural deficit in the United States is reaching such a limit. I don't envy anyone in Washington now. It doesn't look like there's any way out of it without a crisis to me. Uh, and, you know, that's going to play out over the next 10 years at the most, uh, maybe much sooner than that. Uh, so basically, I think that the paradigm we've been in is coming to an end. There's uh, more instability outside the United States. I'm actually really quite pleased and surprised with how well the U.S. economy is holding, has been holding up. It surprises me. I, you know, I, I've been uh, uh, saying that there's something big coming and it keeps on getting put off. But I think that the longer it gets put off, the bigger it's going to end up being. The whatever event is going to be worse because of all the papering over that they do. The, Absolutely. You know, they s- slap yeah. another Band-Aid on it here and, and another patch on it there and keep it rolling down the road. Until there's some big cataclysmic event. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. And you've explained that very nicely in your videos and what that adjustment would look like. I think you have some calculation that it would take an adjustment of about gold going to about $12,000 to actually reprice what's, uh, you know, how we've hollowed everything out. Uh, you know, Speaking it's, of gold, you know, you're a blockchain kind of guy. And I wanted to ask you what you think of gold and silver. Well, I love gold and silver. I love, I think that humans need a way to communicate prices to each other, uh, pieces of information about value and scarcity is what makes civilization work and us able to cooperate, being able to communicate information about value and scarcity. And we do that thing through this magic invention of a price. And that's all prices really are. We need a, a medium through which to communicate those prices. And the a you know, gold and silver have worked great as a medium for thousands of years. We have government mandarins who think that civilization will run better 
if they can distort the field through which we humans communicate that information with each other and because we have to communicate it through their fiat currency. And then they can play games and that distort the messages and make us behave more like they want us to behave, which apparently means to save less and spend more and keep the froth going. So it's all part of the fight for limited government and freedom and liberty is tied up with the, uh, the fight for a form of sound money and a form of money that no government Mandarin can sign a piece of paper and create any more of it. That's what's great about gold and silver and, uh, dare I say, so the, the blockchain revolution is no government Mandarin can write something on a piece of paper and overcome or overwrite the truth. Yeah, uh, you know, um, you can't print gold. That's uh, the uh, main constraint that it has over government. Uh, but, you know, <clears throat> what about your battle with Wall Street? And can you tell us about what regulatory capture is? Yes, it's an actually it was a friend of Milton Friedman, uh, Stigler, in 1971, wrote a paper, uh, Theory of Regulatory Capture, I think was the name, where he, he, he said that maybe we ought to look at things this way. Society sets up regulators to protect us from certain industries. But then we move on. The do-gooders who in society who argued for it, they move on, they have other causes. The industry goes to work and over, overtakes the regulator. And they do that in different ways. It generally has to do with uh, you, just the message gets out eventually that if you're a good boy at the regulators and you regulate for 10 years and they don't come after the industry too hard, then when you get out, there's a nice fat job waiting for you or on the board of directors or something. This all started with the world's first regulator was the Interstate Commerce Commission, 1871, I think. And this pattern developed and it just keeps repeating itself. So the regulator becomes really a piece of the industry and not protecting society. Now, in, back in 2004 and five, I started talking about this and also the possibility that the capture goes even deeper. Well, there's an expression deep capture, which means that it isn't just the industry capturing the regulator, but capturing the congressmen and the senators and maybe the journalists and, and, wow. and, and all the, and I have to say, so I knew in 05 that there was a flaw in the settlement system that could crack and bring down the financial system. And it's been kind of forgotten to history, but that is part of what happened in 08. When Greenspan went before Congress, October 23rd, 2008, you can look up this quote where he said, this is at its core, it's, it's fraud, settlement, and securitization. And the fraud was Bernie Madoff. The securitization was the mortgage-backed securities. Everyone's forgotten, though, that settlement issue he mentioned. At the core of the crisis, the settlement system froze. And that's because there's a lot of slop in it. And, and I, knew, I knew that this was going to happen. And I knew it in about 05. And I came out and started publicly saying, there's this crack at the center of Wall Street and there's a latent derivative risk building up. There are some crooks who are manipulating and thieving through this crack. It's all going to collapse. And the SEC that we think is protecting us is not really protecting us. This is what I was saying in 05. It's really kind of in bed with Wall Street. You well, made the, some enemies then, didn't you? I did. And the, but what's funny is the media's reaction, if you went back at the time, the media, there were pictures of me in the New York Post with UFOs coming out of my head because I had this conspiracy theory to suggest that the government was actually letting bad stuff go on and wasn't and was in bed with Wall Street. And I now I like to say, and I have to mention this, the SEC, so I've had numerous interactions with the SEC over the last 20 years. It's a much better organization and, and than it was back. It's infinitely better than it was between 05 and 08. It was 05 to 08. I thought there were some real bad people in it side it. I think that now it's it's a much I think that they've really corrected themselves and are trying to do the right thing in many respects. In fact, I've kind of been surprised at how lenient they have been towards the crypto revolution. I thought that what went on in the world of these cryptocurrencies was dancing at the very edge of the law. And I'm I'm surprised it took the SEC I thought the SEC showed a lot of patience actually. And I'm kind of glad they're 
they're on the hunt now. Yeah, you know, uh, when when you talk about cryptos, everybody thinks that blockchain is Bitcoin. They don't understand that it's it's very different. This is basically a, a ledger. It's a way of keeping track of things. And then it's uh, a distributed ledger where uh, there's so many copies of it. Uh, if somebody tries to cheat it or make a false entry, they're basically frozen out of the system. So it's it's some a somewhat foolproof uh, way of keeping track of things that is fair and and uh, and can be proven. Uh, and impossible to cheat, unlike the institutions of man, which have proven to be sometimes capturable and corruptible. You can't. You know, to some degree, O8 showed us that large, I think an oligarchy, an oligarchy has formed in the U.S. and has hijacked some processes. And they showed that they could buy themselves all kinds of people in D.C. And they bought themselves senators and they bought themselves congressmen. And they bought themselves regulators. They bought everything you could, that wasn't nailed down. But... Even people so they like get that. to write their own laws regulating them at that point, right? And that's just what happened. But even they can't buy the laws of mathematics. And that's why having this, these functions shift into a cryptographically based, math, cryptographically protected system called blockchain, these ledgers that cannot be, they cannot be altered or there's no, you'd have to cheat the laws of mathematics, to cheat one of these ledgers. Now, I think that all kinds of crooks on Wall Street have ways of cheating the law and ways of, of short-circuiting Washington to keep Washington from reacting, more so 10 years ago than now. But, I mean, I really do, having been a frequent critic of the SEC, I do have to say now it seems to be a, a very professional organization. And they're they're kind of embracing this revolution but the point is you'd have to have those kinds of actors those kinds of prime brokers and stuff the oligarchy even they can't buy laws of mathematics they can't break blockchain based institutions they can they can break and hack and corrupt political institutions and other kinds of institutions built by men but not blockchain yeah uh you're right now you're trying to change the world this is one of the reasons i'm interviewing you i've always been trying to change the world for the better try to make it a better place try to make it fairer and you're doing this right now you've got a uh, a venture called medici ventures and you're trying to renew remove the middlemen from the capital markets money and banking the supply chain identity which i want to know a little bit more about voting but most importantly property rights and lately you have a new project in africa where you're working on trusts and de deeds and trying to secure people's property rights and you're doing this by working with the government i believe aren't you we are we are but we're working with the people, imagine a system where the people on the ground, and it's not a polite word, but we it's always described as like shanty towns. You know, seven and a half billion people on earth, five billion of them live outside the world of formal rights that you and I enjoy, two thirds. And most of them live in what we call barrios or favelas or shanty towns, you know, all over the earth. Urban, you know, per, per, the, the polite word is now peri-urban. Uh, so, per, which is like a, 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 you know, around the around the city, at the edge of the city, they they may live there for generations, and but they don't have any legal claim on the 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 shanty that they live in. Is there a nicer word for that that feels pejorative? But I can't think of another way we describe that. Uh, you know I think you've described it perfectly, actually. It's, okay. You know, well, I don't it's a horrible thing that they have to live outside of the system and without property rights. You really, it's hard for anybody to get ahead of in life. They've sort of tied prosperity together with property rights. They're very interwoven. Well, and really, economic progress begins when you have property rights. Because then you get a piece of paper that says, I own this, and I can take this piece of paper to a bank and borrow $2,000, and 
and get enough capital to start a fruit stand and the whole system can of of capitalism and markets can begin. But until you have that, everything's just on quicksand. So we have a system that we've built over the last eight months. We have a couple hundred people in uh, Zambia doing this now. Uniforms on, they're going through one of these favelas or whatever, shanty downs, and knocking on doors. You have a, an iPad with them, and they say, we know, you know you, how long you've been living here. It's three generations, whatever. They generally have some local deed, not recognized by anyone, but just some informal neighborhood deed. And our people are saying, let us take a, we, would you like the government to recognize your ownership of this land? We can take a picture on the iPad of any document you have, that certificate from 80 years ago, the letter from your grandmother saying that this is being willed to you, whatever thing you have, we, we take the pictures, collect the pictures, uh, walk the perimeter of your property with the iPad so everything gets geolocated, boom, 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 and, you, and generate you a title, a legal government title. We've taken the cost of doing that down about 90, over 90%. I think that the system we have built and the way we're doing this between blockchain and mobile apps and this, that, and the other thing, we, I think we're taking the, about 92% of the cost out of, out of generating that title for these countries. We've also built for Rwanda, it hasn't been delivered yet, but it's been announced and it's in progress. A Rwanda, by the way, is a very interesting company, very leading edge. It's like Estonia on the whole e-governance and digital citizenship thing. Rwanda wants to be like the little Singapore of Africa, and which is you know terrific. This is a country that 22 or so years ago had, remember that that famous massacre. That uh, yeah. so there it's so we are building the online platform. They have issued eight million titles. We have a, a online platform that's like wrapping up, I think, this week. So everyone will be able to interact in Rwanda. You can interact regarding your title, selling it to somebody, it, willing it to someone, buying something from someone else, all through this platform. The advantage is you don't have to interact with a government official. The advantage of that is it's when you interact with government officials that, that what happens, Mike? You're a man of the world. What happens when in the third world? When there's around? a whole bunch of things that happen, but because of the corruption, uh, there there can uh, be, uh, you know, they can ask for bribes. Exactly. Uh, they can prevent things from happening. Uh, the, the, where the I live, you have to go over to this office and get a form, and then you go across town to get a stamp right. on it, and then you go over here, and it takes weeks to do and something that should take ten out. seconds. Every one of what? them has his hand out for a little bribe. If Mexicans mm -hmm. have, have, have a great slang word, la mordita, the little bite, you know, the little bite. And if you're in India and you want to expand your factory, you need to hire 20 more people and buy more electricity. You got to go to different offices and each one of them, you fill out applications and get stamps and get other people to stamp the stamps and on and on. And every one of them has to be paid off. But if you make it so these kinds of interactions can be done online through a system and the up the higher ups in Rwanda realize this, they're the ones who, have, who commissioned this system. We're going to be able to do so much in the next five years. I think we're, we've created something we call government as a service. That's really what's developing within Overstock, within Medici. So Overstock, re, you know, that company owns, besides the retail business, it owns this uh, Medici, this blockchain incubator, which has 23 companies that are working in different areas of basically bringing government online and blockchain secure, which is not only going to reduce the costs, something like 90%, but it's going to become incapable of being corrupted. I actually don't want to talk about it too much publicly because I'm afraid you know, so far no one's really organizing against it. They haven't figured out how much, basically the crooks of the world are going to Get, are going to get really squeezed as blockchain gets adopted. But they don't seem to have figured that out yet. Yeah, they will get squeezed. You know, one of the things that was uh, left out of the conversation here is uh, all of those politicians and uh, bureaucrats that take the little bite, as you call it, the bribes all the way up through the system, every one of them, we also pay through our taxes. And this is a frictional loss of government that is completely unnecessary now that blockchain has just made irrelevant. Yep. 
Yeah, we didn't like their world, so we invented our own. It's so it, you know, for six thousand years we've done it this one way by forming and paying centralized institutions to guarantee to achieve trust, so strangers can interact with each other and trust. And we create these third-party institutions: a mint, a land titling office, Airbnb, the Visa card company. They're all the same business model: strain allowing strangers to interact. And who normally couldn't trust each other, but they just have to trust that third party institution. Well, that those institutions can now be disrupted through blockchain. You can achieve trust through these crypt through cryptography and and smart contracts and such. So really it's it's really I mean, it's gonna be I think more dramatic to watch than the internet revolution itself. Yeah, think of uh, how much more efficient and how much more, you know, the private sector creates all prosperity. All wealth in the world comes from people uh, working.